The Ferrari is exactly the same in the human context as, say, the peacock's tail is in the peacock. Hi, I'm Zach Weissmuller with Reason TV. We're here with Gad Saad. He holds the Concordia University Research Chair in Evolutionary Behavioral Sciences and Darwinian Consumption and is the author of the book, The Consuming Instinct, What Juicy Burgers, Ferraris, Pornography, and Gift Giving Reveal About Human Nature. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. In basic terms, the book's about evolutionary psychology and its relationship to consumerism. What does evolutionary psychology have to say about what we spend our money on? There are a myriad of consumer phenomena that happen in exactly the same way around the world. So they transcend culture, they tr transcend time period, and they do that precisely because they are part of a common biological heritage. And so what I try to do is look for these universals in the consumer arena and then argue that they are rooted in our shared biological heritage. Ferraris, pornography, Juicy burgers and gift giving. What is the significance of those four things? Why did you choose those right. to put that, in That's a great question. So I, basically I'm trying to demonstrate that there are four key Darwinian modules or meta drives that drive much of our consumer patterns. When it comes to juicy burgers, this refers to the survival modules. So most animals have to face two recurring problems, making sure they don't become somebody's dinner and making sure that they find dinner. And so our evolved gustatory preferences are exactly an adaptation to that. It's not difficult for us to then succumb to the temptation of the Burger King and the McDonald's because they are offering products that are fully congruent with our taste buds. When it comes to pornography or Ferraris, that refers to the mating module. So let's take, for example, the Ferrari. Well, I argue that the Ferrari is exactly the same in the human context as, say, the peacock's tail is in the peacock. So the peacock shows his tail, and the females will choose that male who has the most iridescent colors, the biggest tail, the most symmetric patterns. And the F Ferrari is effectively signaling similar things, but in the human context. We did a study a few years ago with one of my uh, former graduate students where we brought people into the lab, men, and we had them either drive a fancy Porsche or a beaten up old sedan. At the end of each of these driving conditions, we would collect salivary assays to measure their fluctuating levels of testosterone. And as you might expect, you put a young male in a Porsche and his testosterone shoots through the roof. Because that endocrinological mechanism is akin to saying, hey, I, just, I, I was just imbued with a, with a social win. We know in many social species, when two males fight, the winner has a rise in testosterone, the loser has a drop of testosterone. And what's an example of that among women? How do women's behaviors as consumers change as a function of their menstrual cycles? And so I did a study uh, recently with one of my doctoral students where we tracked for 35 contiguous days so that we covered the full menstrual cycle. Every imaginable consumatory behavior that a woman engages in across those 35 days. When it comes to food, women engage in a lot more food-related behaviors in the luteal stage of their, so in the non-fertile stage of their menstrual cycle. In the fertile stage of their menstrual cycle, they engage in a lot more beautification-related things. So they're engaging in sexual signaling. So how provocatively they dress, whether they wear high heels, whether, how they wear their hair, how much skin they show, ends up to be perfectly correlated to whether or not they are in the fertile phase. So here's two examples, testosterone in one case and the menstrual cycle in one case, that demonstrates how our hormones affect our behaviors as consumers. So you're saying that our consumption is driven by these Darwinian mechanisms. A lot of regulation now assumes we have not enough information, or we have bad information. We need to have the calories listed at McDonald's, or we need to have warnings listed on cigarette packages. Uh, but you seem to be saying it's not that the information is bad, it's that we have these natural drives within us. That's exactly right. So if you're coming from the standard social marketing perspective, consumers engage in bad behaviors or behaviors that have deleterious consequences because they don't have the right information. Teach them and they will behave better. But we know for a fact that that's not right. When it comes to smoking for young males, uh, telling them that they might develop lung cancer doesn't work very well. Telling them that they stand the risk of becoming impotent at a very young age actually does affect their behavior. And it doesn't take much of a biologist to understand that telling a young male that he might be impotent and not be able to perform is an effective 
you know, communication strategy. So we can finally kind of scrap this idea that it's the evil genius ad executives or media messages or the capitalist system making us want all these things that we don't right. need. The advertisers are effective to the extent that they provide you with messages that are congruent with your evolved human nature, right? So uh, they're not providing you with wants and needs that are completely inconsistent with your human nature, right? So if, you, if, if I gave you a budget, an unlimited budget to sell raw broccoli, it probably wouldn't work. But if I gave you a very small budget to sell fatty, juicy burgers, well, it's not, it's not a difficult sell because it is consistent with what I want, right? So uh, Harlequin Romance is able to sell romance novels to women around the world precisely because it contains a certain narrative that appeals to women's evolved sexual fantasies. And so again, advertisers are not these evil geniuses, as you said, they are providing us with messages that ultimately have to speak to our human nature. But to, to reduce every human choice down to a kind of Darwinian imperative, you know, needing to pass on our genes to the next generation, aren't we able to kind of rationally overcome that now? Don't we have an evolved mind that no longer needs to be looked at as this sort of Stone Age brain? Right. Evolution psychology doesn't argue that we're deterministically fatalistic in our behaviors because everything is an interaction between your genes and the environment and your unique upbringing and so on. So certainly the idea of biological determinism is not of relevance to evolution psychology. That said, despite the fact that we have this knowledge, it is an alluring trap to fall into. And that's why in many cases, moral philosophers and theologians have tried to warn us against the seven deadly sins precisely because they're difficult to extricate ourselves from. Biological evolution, it's basically indisputable at this point. I mean, we have fossil records. We have verified it in laboratories. We've done artificial selection breeding. When it comes to evolutionary psychology, do we have that same kind of evidence? How do you convince us that right. it's a science and not you're coming up with these creative stories to kind of fit your premise? I mean, that's a great question because that's, that's one that you constantly hear as an evolutionary scientist, uh, or you're just coming up with just so storytelling. Mm -hmm. Interestingly though, when evolutionary biologists come up with similar hypotheses for every other known species, they're valid scientific hypotheses. But if somehow you engage in the exact same scientific method when it comes to the human mind, oh, well, you're just engaging in just so storytelling. And the reality is that the data that typically evolution psychologists collect to support or to test one of their hypotheses is actually extraordinarily more uh, meaty, if you'd like, than the standard behavioral sciences. In the book, you do actually mention there is a sort of cultural fossil that evolutionary psychologists can look to. Exactly. So uh, the human mind doesn't fossilize. But what does fossilize, I argue, are the cultural products that are created by human minds. So if we take song lyrics, troubadours in the Middle Ages, hip hop songs today, Hindi songs or Urdu songs are all going to have roughly the same themes that are covered despite otherwise radically different musical genres. And those themes are? Well, in the case of, say, song lyrics, uh, universal mating preferences. So what are the things that men typically sing about and what are the things that women typically sing about turn out to be extraordinarily similar across otherwise unbelievably disparate musical genres. Men will sing about the women's beauty, about specific body parts. I like big butts, I cannot lie. <laughs> I like big butts and I cannot lie. Uh, Sir mix a lot, I believe. Yeah, right? I believe so. Uh, uh, and women will typically denigrate men who, for example, are low social status. Bills, 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 uh, no scrubs. All of that, there's endless other songs that basically say, look, if you're low status, if you're unemployed, if you, if you don't have ambition, don't approach me, I'm not interested. You do a lot of comparing what men in general do and women in general. The stereotype is that it would be the religious right attacking uh, evolutionary scientists but it seems like you're getting it from left, right, all over the political Absolutely. spectrum. You're exactly right. Uh, there are endless ideological camps that hate evolutionary psychology for no reason that has to do with science, but everything to do with it being perceived as an attack on their pet you know, ideological theory. So if I am a feminist, I reject innate sex differences. If I'm a social constructivist, I reject the possibility that we have innate blueprints in our brain when we're born, and so on and so forth. But they're driven by ideology, not by science. Scott Zad, thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. For Reason TV, I'm Zach Weissmuller.